Hey guys, this is Savannah from earthandwater.co. Today I'm with Andrea Hunt. She's a personal personal empowerment coach and EFT uh, trainer, but there's, I, I was just, I, I didn't do very well, good notes on that one. I was just copying and pasting EFT for a better life, which is awesome because she's going to teach us how to live all of our dreams by becoming a uh, nomads and digital nomads that's what I've wanted to do forever and you know what I've started implementing it a little bit because it's funny how things work you know you have an idea in your head and you're like man I would love to do that and then things don't pan out the way that you expect them to or want them to and then if you can I'm not sure how like into manifestation and the magic with the K stuff uh, but if they tell us that one of the steps is to let go of mm -hmm. the, you know direction and getting the thing that we think we want and then so if you really let go of it I have woken up here on the other side of it and I'm like ah, I'm actually doing this in a way not like I had not in the grand schemes because you know we see on people on Instagram and online they're traveling Europe and living in or staying in castles and you know just living the absolute dream and we're over here daydreaming about that man I wish I could go overseas and do those things but uh here I am I'm camping like every weekend with my laptop so I'm still Amazing. doing it it just looks a lot different than that but it's beautiful in its own way and I love every minute of it and maybe one day we'll get across seas and be able to do it over there too absolutely and things just happen naturally I think it's it's such a um a difficult thing to balance like intention and letting go you know, being like putting the intention out there, but then being like, okay, how do I just be so I can see what kind of comes of this, you know, idea and manifestation? Yeah, yeah, go, uh, definitely. Because you have to do that whole inspired action thing. And if you yes. are trying to steer yourself in a specific direction, uh, but also not putting all of your eggs in the same basket, it, it's a very delicate balance for sure. How did you end up here? How did you end up doing all of this? Um, as a coach? So actually, like, um, I've always been into personal growth. I shouldn't say always, but let's say like the last 10, 10, 15 years, just mostly because like I wanted to heal some of my own, you know, patterns and childhood things and stuff like that. And so I, you know, go to all these workshops and stuff like that. And I was like, man, this is like, I, I love being able to do this and feel empowered. And the kind of the more that I went on, I was like, this would be like a really good job for me. Like I, my background is communications. Like I did journalism. I did um, my, my master's is in communications as well. And so like, I've always been kind of a people person. I've always been very interested in people's stories and like, you know, being the person in the, you know, who's the friend that's like, yeah, you should totally do that. Like the motivator, you know? And so um, during the pandemic, like many people, I unfortunately got laid off from my job. And um, the thing is, it was the it was the second time in six months. And so, like, this is the crazy story: is like I was working at this um, job doing content marketing, and it was like a an immuno oncology company that was doing different kind of software for tissue analysis. Great job! I loved my colleagues. I loved my life. Everything's going fine, but the parent company um, decided that they wanted to dissolve four of the departments, and I was in one of them. So that was basically one day to the other, and we're like, okay. Now we don't have jobs, you know, and um, at least like I was really lucky. I got offered another job right away. Like, and I thought like, oh, man, this was an opportunity that I could have tried to take my life in a different direction. Because if I'm honest, like that job was absolutely wonderful. But like, was it my purpose? Was it my passion? Was it something that I was like really, you know, living for? No. And so I thought about like kind of getting into coaching, but I was like, no, no, no. And I took like the safe route. I got the job offer. I was like, nope, don't rock the boat just do it. I had all the imposter syndrome and like, you know, negative self-talk. You don't know what you're doing. You can't do that, whatever. So I got the other job that was January, 2020. Okay. So do the math here. <laughs> Suddenly the pandemic came. Um, I was working, you know, like really, really hard during that time. But then at the end of the probationary period, me and then several other people, they were just like, sorry, we have no idea what's happening. Germany had just gotten out of the first lockdown. We were going into the second one several months later. And so a lot of companies panicked. And so they didn't want to keep on these people if they weren't sure what was happening with the direction of the company. So then I found myself like twice in six months, I was like, okay, 
what is going on here? Like, what are the odds of this? You know, first of all, like universe, like, come on. (laughs) But then I started to think about, okay, like, what am I supposed to be learning from this? You know? And so at that moment, like I kind of had like a door open. I was like, well, I really am am in control of deciding what I'm going to do with my life. Yes, Yes, I could do the safe thing, which is what, like, just grab another job right away if I can find it. Or I can use this time, because like I said, we were going back into lockdown to actually get trained as a coach and, you know, do EFT tapping and everything. So that's the route that I took, you know, during lockdown, like instead of, you know, binging on Netflix, I was doing coaching courses. And the only benefit of lockdown was that everything was online then. So my coaching course was in the UK because I'm in Germany and I wanted a, I wanted an English speaking one because I'm like, if I'm going to coach, I have to have to start in English, you know, <laughs> baby steps. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I did that. And so EFT tapping is something that I had been doing on myself for like 10 years. I found it as a way to manage anxiety, manage stress, like just manage my emotional health. And so I uh, hadn't planned on using EFT and like integrating it into the coaching until like I would be coaching somebody and uh things would come up, you know, like resistance, negative self-talk, you know, self-esteem issues and limiting beliefs. And there's only so far that you can go with just talking about them and making the intention. Because a lot of times, like you might want something, but your body and like your fears are like, no. (laughs) And then you resist and you, you know, you self-sabotage. I was like, man, I'm like, we could use EFT for this, but I wasn't, I wasn't trained yet. So I went and got that certification. And so now that's how I integrated those two things of transformational coaching and EFT. And because I'm working from my laptop, I mean, like I'm based in Germany most of the time, but I also am in Spain in the winter and I can go different places and be a digital nomad. So I'm kind of an expat nomad now. That's That's awesome. (laughs) Uh, So you're from the States originally, right? Yep. I'm from Minnesota originally. Minnesota. And then how, yep. how long, how many years have you been living abroad? I moved to China in 2006. That's awesome. <laughs> what, yeah. What, was that an easy choice? Was it scary? So it's a funny story. Like I actually, I, I took Chinese classes as a kid. I was a, you know, very curious kid, very interesting in language. And so my parents We're like, well, if you want to go to China, you know, you should start taking Chinese classes. I don't think that they ever expected me to be like, well, yes, yes, I do want it. And so I I started taking them as a kid. In Minnesota, we have Concordia Languages Camps. So I went to Chinese camp uh, every year. So I had always wanted to go to China. And it wasn't until like I I finished uh, my university. I had a, a boyfriend at the time. Things were very rocky. And when I went to go travel in South America for a few months, things kind of completely deteriorated for a multitude of reasons. So then suddenly like this whole, you know, I had this whole open space of like, what am I going to do? Because I was not in a good place with the breakup. And sometimes those really, those feelings where you have the rug completely pulled out from under you also give you the option to be like, okay, so what am I going to do now? (laughs) And so I had met this girl in Bolivia at my hostel as we're eating pancakes and she's telling me about how she taught English in Korea. She was like from Missouri. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not a teacher. Like I, my degree is in journalism. Like I can't do that. And she's like, no, I'm pretty sure like most places you just need a college degree. And so my idea was, yeah, maybe I'll just go teach English for a few months or something until this breakup whole thing like <laughs> subsides. And it was one of those moments where because I was just in a very difficult spot, I was like, I need something new and I need to be brave about it because I don't want to stay here. I was in Athens, Georgia, and I was like, everything reminds me of this relationship. Like, I just need to go do something different. And doing that and getting outside of my comfort zone was one of the most terrifying things. I mean, moving to China, like I didn't know anybody. I didn't speak Chinese then. Um, But it was actually one of the best things that I ever did. It completely changed the course of my life. I ended up in Germany as a result of it. (laughs) And um, I ended up working for like the radio in China. And I had like a job at different companies, like as a journalist. So it was, yeah, it was amazing. That's how I ended up not going back to the US. I ended up in Germany. So life works out in very funny ways. Yeah, I've always wanted to travel. Um, I. (laughs) I always thought I would travel that's the thing like I grew up 
it's funny that you said that it was in Athens, Georgia, because I'm in Athens, Alabama. So, oh, are you? <laughs> mm-hmm. So not a, not only next door to that, but the same city name. It, that's really cool. Uh, synchronicities, right? But I have I was born and raised here my whole life. My grandparents went to the same school that I went to. Wow. Right? Yeah, we know everybody, and um. I hated it. I hated that I knew everybody uh, for a multitude of reasons that we're not going to get into. But I spent my entire childhood just counting down the days until I hit 18 so that I could travel. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care, but I Mm. was going all of the places I really wanted to go. Um, Venice is my top. Venice and Egypt. I want to go to Venice before it sinks. And I want to go to Egypt and just see the pyramids. And then uh, those are my top two. And then uh, Rome, you know, all of the, man, that's all I wanted. And then I messed up and fell in love. And so I never left. I've been right here ever since living vicariously through all of you guys who do this and share it with us online. So I think that's super cool. How many languages do you speak? Too fluently, English and Spanish, and then I studied in Italy and Argentina, so that's I I learned uh, Italian as well in my undergrad, and then um, sorry, the Argentina part is not connected to the Italian part, but it was in that same year that I went. So sorry, um, and then I went to China, and then I I studied Chinese when I was there. It's been it's been a while. It's pretty rusty right now because I haven't really spoken in about ten years, and then my German is decent. I don't know people tell me it's better than I think it is, but I'm not satisfied with my level of German. But I'm learning to do EFT in German. That's my that's my goal for this year. Like I'm gonna do it. Cool. Um, I only speak English really, but I took three years of Spanish, maybe four, and came out with like the vocabulary of a two year old. And then yeah. um, I was gonna get Rosetta Stone back when Rosetta Stone was like the only thing that you did via you know self-study and whatnot and I I was gonna get Spanish because you know I was like gotta get this down and um my friend talked me into doing French I was (laughs) I don't know why I needed that but she was like no let's learn French together and I was like but that makes no sense and she was like French and I was (laughs) especially in the U.S. like I mean if you were in Canada French makes more sense but in the U.S. like 30 percent of the population or something speaks Spanish so it's like it's a useful language right (laughs) exactly but she was like French and eventually I was like okay because you know I don't know um so I know probably more French than I do Spanish which makes no sense to me or anything but (laughs) it all gets really boggled in my head because it's all Latin based and uh then I started uh we took taekwondo classes me and my children for a little while and the instructor was teaching us uh Korean so that was cool too I love languages I I think they're so cool and I talk about them in almost every episode so I just had to touch on that for a second but um tell us about EFT because uh, I've built my entire platform on managing stress and anxiety and overwhelm mental health type stuff and EFT was something that helped me a lot I don't know much about it at all I just know that I'm tapping in certain places it, it kind of it releases energy and gets the energy moving and helps release those emotions and stuff. So tell us about that, how we could integrate some of that. So, yeah, I mean, basically, like, so there's two main ways that you can use EFT. So I'll tell you about So the first one is like for emotional health. So everything that you just mentioned, like with stress, anxiety, worry, anger, sadness, whenever you need to kind of regulate your emotions and like connect your kind of calm down your body from whatever emotional reaction that you're having. And then the other one is more belief based. So like um, the way that it works is basically when you have, you know, energy systems and you have acupuncture points all over your body. So for the purposes of EFT, it stands for the emotional freedom technique. So you just basically tap lightly and it sounds really funny, but it sends a signal to the brain to stop the fight, flight or freeze response so that you can calm down. And it's, um, it's something that like it used to be kind of considered more like (laughs) woo-woo and then now like they've done all of these scientific studies and like these research programs and found that like they can use it in clinical settings for things like PTSD, like different traumas, phobias. Um, And so 
while I don't deal specifically with traumas, what I deal with are the belief parts. And so like, this is the part that, um, that I wanted to talk about more because like the first component is like managing your emotional health, because when you're not regulating your, your emotions and your body's response to them, then you're all over the place. You're more reactive, you're explosive, you're getting triggered (laughs) and all of these things instead of responding in like from a grounded place. And so, um, that's one of the things, the, the key things that I that I work on first. And then the second part, which I find really fascinating, is how you can use EFT for beliefs uh, that you have. And so, like, you know, we grow up over the course of our lives, you know, acquiring these little beliefs from what we were told, from our parents, from society, the way we're supposed to be, the way we're not supposed to be, expectations, all these things, and of course, our experiences. And so the problem with like the beliefs that we create from these experiences, like a lot of times they come from when we were kids. So we don't even know any better. We're just kind of learning, right? And absorbing things. So one of the best examples that I always give is like, if you are eight years old and let's say you've got like, you have to go read your paper in front of the class or something. And let's say the teacher insults your paper, tells you that it's horrible. Everybody laughs at you in the class. You're humiliated. So in that moment, you just learn it's not safe to be seen. It's not safe to be heard. They're all going to laugh at me, criticize me. And I'm not good at putting myself out there because you just learned that, you know, the needle or it's not the needle. Sorry, like the, it's the, the nail that st- sticks out gets hit. That's what they say in China. And oh. it's like, once you learn that, it's really hard to kind of step out of that comfort zone and take risks moving forward because your body's energy system is like, I remember that that was not safe. That felt awful. And so then moving forward, any situation that you perceive that looks or feels like that, you're going to still have that reaction in your body. And this is where EFT is really interesting because, you know, of course, if you learn that as a kid, and then let's say you have like a, a client presentation at work and like, you know, you're supposed to be the one giving you know, the PowerPoint or whatever. And before that, you're like anxious and sweaty and you're, you know, maybe you call in sick because you self-sabotage yourself. So it's like, even if you have, you know, prepared and you want to do a really great job, you have all of this fear and resistance inside of you. And so this is really where EFT comes into play here, because then you can go through all these through the negative round where you acknowledge all of your your fears, your resistance, and all of your your thoughts and feelings about it. And so this is the part that normally we don't allow ourselves to kind of articulate and feel this because we're like, no, I've got this. Like, it's fine. It's fine. I can handle it. And inside your brain is like, it is not fine. (laughs) And so your, your body, you're like, you're sweating, you know, you're all tense and everything. Maybe you have a knot in your stomach. And so this is where with EFT, by actually articulating it, and like I tell my clients, just, all right, what are you feeling? You're like, I am terrified. Like, I am so scared. They're all going to laugh at me. You know, I'm worried about this and that and whatever. And there's something about that process of like tapping on the acupuncture points as you're articulating it, this, and you just go through everything, everything you possibly think of, you know, why did my boss make me do this? I can't hate him, you know? that you you release those negative emotions surrounding that topic and you release the emotional charge so that then when you go to a positive round then you can it's like kind of putting on positive layers after you've cleaned off the the dirt <laughs> you know because i would say like you can tell yourself affirmations like i got this and whatever but if you haven't cleared what's like underneath it's like polishing a dirty plate you know, you're like you you haven't like fixed the 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 original problem, so it might like make you feel good for a while, like just to polish it. But then, like afterwards, it's all gonna come back, and that's where EFT is so powerful because when we have these limiting beliefs, the negative self talk, you can quiet it, so that then you can put the empowering parts on top. Like, I can do this. You know, this is not the end of the world. This is not a life or death situation. You know, maybe I'm being all or nothing. Maybe I'm you know, blowing it out of proportion and being able to kind of reframe the situation so that it doesn't feel so scary anymore. And that's my favorite, my favorite, favorite process in EFT, because it's just amazing having the person be like, huh, it doesn't really feel like a big deal anymore. (laughs) And like at the beginning of the session, they were like, I can't believe I have to do this, you know, crying and really, really upset. So that's a little story about like why I think it's important. Yeah. And, you know, any tools help. And 
tapping is a very helpful tool that I've found that helps me a lot. Um, some people, if you don't know, people who know me in real life are not surprised, but um, doing this online and whatnot, putting myself out there, I, it's funny that you used that example because I flashed back instantly to the a time when I had to do a presentation in front of the class in high school and um, might have been middle school. And I passed out because I was so, can't do yep. it, can't do it, sorry, no, nope, not safe, so yeah, sweating, uh, suddenly can't breathe, the tunnel vision, it, mm -hmm. absolutely, and um, doing interviews like this right here, I still sometimes, because you know, like, you can clear it out, but in a way, pieces of it are left, like remnants and whatnot, so mm -hmm. Even if I have gotten through the fear of it and it's really not that big of a deal anymore, sometimes I will start getting really sweaty and really shaky and stuff anyway uh, on mm -hmm. a regular basis like this week and it still happens from time to time. And I think that people really need to know that uh, there's not a certain type of people who are made for this and then certain people are not you know you can't you're like oh well I'm just not made for that that's not me I can't get in front of yep. people and I mean, you don't have to but you can if you want to no matter where you're starting out mm -hmm. I didn't talk I was almost mute for like 20 years and now I'm doing this I and that's why I do this because I I know that if I can get through it then anybody can get through it because have you ever seen the big bang theory yeah okay Raj you know how he can't talk to girls and he's yeah yeah <laughs> but he can talk to his friends like hush hush one, that that was me I could talk to one person if I knew them uh yeah but that I couldn't I was mute any other time I couldn't make words come out of my mouth people would talk to me and I would just <laughs> yeah. but tapping's helped a lot and I wonder if I'm because I'm neurodivergent also, and that has a lot to do with it. And I found that tapping helps me keep focused mm -hmm. and calm down. And I wonder if like um, stimming, are you familiar with what stimming is? I've So I, yeah, I just learned that word this year actually, but yeah, apparently isn't it kind of similar? It's just like being able to find a spot that like kind of calms you by the repetition. Is that Sort of. It's a lot of things. It can be noises that you make. It can be uh, tapping, flapping, those types of things. Um, it's very often notable with uh, highly autistic people who are more openly STEM. To, but it's a self-regulation thing. It's an emotional and um, nervous system type regulation thing because uh, the world is so overwhelming and so overstimulating that it helps to uh, have a focal point, essentially, mm -hmm. is what helps me a little bit. But yeah, tapping is definitely something that has helped with me with that for sure. Absolutely. Because I think like um, one of the reasons that I found is that because I had like several exams in one week and I was I was so panicked that I just couldn't calm down. And like while I I love meditation, if I'm in that kind of state where like I was just I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't sit still like long enough to like, oh, let's try to like, <laughs> you know, breathe and whatever. I mean, because I was just like hyperventilating. Mm -hmm. And so it was because like I've, I found I don't know if you know Brad Yates. Brad Yates's uh, EFT videos, no, nope. but he's wonderful. He has like thousands of just like, you know, five, 10 minutes on YouTube. And so I found this one, it was like panic and fear right now. And I'm like, that's the one, <laughs> that's the one I'm going to try. And so it was just kind of like starting, you know, here on the breast one. Cause I, I learned that there were different, you know, um, points. Like I had learned that part, but I was just like trying to be like, okay, just let's stick with one thing. And then I could follow along. And I was like, I feel better than I have in like five days. Like I was like, <laughs> I was like to the point where like I, I was like absolutely inconsolable. And I'm like 10 minutes later, I went from a 10 to like a nine. And I was like, okay, let's see. Let's just see what happens if I do it again. And so I just kept going down. Like I went from like a nine to a seven. And then, and I was just like, what is this sorcery? This is amazing. <laughs> you know, like I have to do this for everything. And so that's how I found it. And even still, I mean, I'd say that most of the time, I mean, because I, I learned that when I started as part of my morning routine, my day is completely different in terms of just feeling 
centered, grounded, and calm. And also like, oh, sorry, let me finish my sentence. Then if I don't do it, like if I'm on vacation and I, you know, I'm, I'm traveling with friends or people and then I don't get to do it. And I'm like, okay, no, I really would like to tap because I want, I want to have that centered and grounded feeling. But even like, you know, if you're on, um, I mean, here we take the train or like the buses or something like that. And just being able, I don't know if you know the, the finger points. Cause like, if you're on a bus, like you don't always want to be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just because people are like, I don't know what she's doing. That looks kind of crazy or whatever, but if you, you can always do it like on your knuckles and just being able to like learn that has been really, really helpful. And I always tell other people to do it as well. Okay. Yeah, that is helpful because uh, I have definitely been tapping in public and like got some but weird even looks. This is like, people don't really notice it because even like just the breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, why you're doing this. People don't know what you're doing. They just <laughs> It almost looks normal. It almost looks normal. Exactly. Whereas, you know, this is like a little weirder <laughs> like <laughs> yeah the face tapping though is what has probably helped me the most and then the um on the ribs underneath the mm -hmm. arms those are yep. the two points that help me the most because I, I guess like there's lots of points that you could do and um I, like I said I don't have any kind of qualification I've never read into this I only know about EFT through doing interviews with people who because I've been in the mental health field for years and, and people people love this EFT and I have clients come to me and they're like do you know anything about EFT and I'm like I, I mean I know a little bit but I don't know anything I've never read on it I've never anything just from what my experience uh hands-on and whatnot but um I imagine you can you just try out a bunch of points and you find the one that works best for you right well or you can't I mean like the rounds are really them? helpful but sometimes people especially if they don't if they don't if they're not familiar with it, they're afraid that they're doing it wrong. And so they're so worried that they're doing it wrong, that it's not helping. And so sometimes I'm like, okay, just literally just do it on your chest. Like, you know, breathe in through your nose. That way that you don't have to feel like you're, oh God, am I doing it in the wrong order or something like that? Because sometimes it can be, it can be confusing if, if it's your first time or something, you know? So there is specific recipes. Yeah. I mean, there's a specific way that you do the rounds, but different practitioners also have different points. Like some people do like wrists or like back of the back of the neck for example mm, that's a good one like under the chest boobs area like it's like <laughs> I don't know the, the specific name for that one but like <laughs> cool yeah um, it does help to clear things though and I like how you touched on the affirmations earlier because you're right you can say all the affirmations in the world they're not going to do any good if you're lying to yourself or in denial or they're not truthful. You have to get to a place where they're truthful before they'll work. And sometimes that can be a little challenging because, you know, how can you go from this extreme to the other extreme to from like, let's say I, I cannot get in, or I can do this. You know, for mm -hmm. example, I can do this when you really don't think you can. And historically, like you have not, and you even passed out a couple of times trying to do this. So you can tell yourself all day long, I can do this. It's not going to make it true unless you believe it. Because then you're just mm -hmm. going to get it. You're going to end up psyching yourself out, honestly. And you're going to get up there and it's going to be worse because you were focusing on it. Uh, yeah. So how do you get from, I can't do this to, I can do this with it being truthful and yeah, tapping is a great way. Uh, baby steps, honestly. Mm -hmm. But then we're going off on a tangent. But I like like so. What you said is really good, and um, because you can get yourself like you don't have to go all into like I am confident, for example. But like, what was the example like uh, that you just gave a second ago? Sorry, I can do it. I can, I can do, do it. it. Yeah. So like, for example, instead of just doing like launching into like I can do this because your brain's like you liar you can yeah. <laughs> you can you can start with phrases that are a little bit more gentle like I'm open to the idea that I can learn to do this I'm willing to believe that I'm learning all the time and I'm getting better every day and I learned new things since last year and I learned new things since five years ago and I can probably learn some new things today so you kind of like ease into it because <laughs> it I, feels more believable than if you're just like, I'm a great public speaker. And like, you don't believe that when you say it, you know, if that's, if that's always been like a hurdle. Yeah, absolutely. So of all these places that you've lived, which one would have been your favorite? 
because I'm that's... really big into cultures also yeah. I, I'm really big into like the western culture I hate it I hate everything about it and that's another thing that I'm doing out here is trying to like um there's other ways to live that are better because uh, <laughs> you know in Spain they do that actually we had an we had a, my aunt had a foreign exchange student from Spain a couple of years ago and I just honed in I was like I have so many tell questions. me more yeah <laughs> yes and uh so I always come back to her story and she told me that one of the biggest culture shocks was how we schedule things in the west like everybody's just off doing their own things like you know people everybody leaves at different times and everybody gets back at different times and the school the school day is just so long because she said that everything in Spain is really family oriented so everybody gets up at the same time everybody eats breakfast together and then everybody goes off to school or work or wherever you gotta go and then around noon everybody goes home eats dinner or eats lunch together takes a nap which I think is fabulous because I have to have a nap every day <laughs> oh, that's and, a great idea and then they go off back to school for a couple of hours or back to work for a couple of hours or whatever they do and then they come home and everybody has dinner together and then everybody goes out and does their evening activities together and I was just like that is what we need that is what the world is supposed to be because every one of us is drowning in overwhelm and the hustle of not only the hustle of trying to make ends meet honestly but the hustle of like oh gosh I have to figure out what's for dinner tonight and then I have to do laundry and then I have to make sure that everything's cleaned up and then and mm. that's too much just the basic bare bones of life mm. is too much for any one person and people are out here beating themselves up about it when it's not their fault and I have to reiterate this all the time please do not beat yourself up about it if you can't handle the basic barebone tasks of life because it was never it's too much for any one person and we need to get back to that village community aspect of doing everything together and sharing the workload as a team so mm -hmm. I already know I love Spain never been <laughs> what to me you would like it though because it, it's just there's like a slower pace to it and I think I think that one of the things that I really do appreciate about Europe and this is just from having lived in, in different places but they really have more of a work-life balance focus um whereas I don't know like in Germany, for example, people use all of their holiday days and they're just like all right so like in Germany if you have kids they get August off so they're like see you guys in September we're taking the month off and that's completely normal awesome <laughs> and I know that my American colleagues were like what is going on with you guys like what do you mean that like you know Martin left for the month <laughs> you know <laughs> and like nobody has any problem taking sick days I mean but it's just it's a very it's it's set up very differently because especially in Germany what I've noticed which is very interesting is like it's not about how long you work like they want you to work smarter not harder so like they could, I mean, whereas when I worked in China, everybody stayed in the office like 10 hours. It does not mean that anybody was doing anything those 10 hours. It's just that you can't really leave until the boss leaves or it makes you look lazy and bad. So I mean, everybody's in there, but like if people are watching movies and like also, I mean, in the US people are like on Facebook or like doing whatever they're on social media and not really maybe working all the time. And in Germany, they like come in, they know their responsibilities and their tasks. There's no micromanagement. They just responsibly do their stuff they're not on social media and then they just go home and like spend time with their families and like go on a bike ride or something like that. I was like, this is so weird. Like, but that's really amazing. So, I mean, I don't know. I think I do really appreciate that about um, Europe, how they prioritize that. Cause it was not that way. At least in the other countries that I've, that I've lived in, you know? So I do really appreciate that. And it's like, it's okay to take a day off. And like, people are like, yep, Friday afternoons, not coming to the office, spending time with my family. We're going to the park. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. That, that is awesome. And you know, it's so, it's so opposite in the U S it's very, um, from a lot of directions for when people, the norm is being afraid to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, working yourself to the bone 12 hour days ridiculous mm -hmm. shifts uh family <laughs> you have to pretend you don't have one honestly mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. as a woman in yeah. in business you have to because we're already seen as a 
problematic because oh they're gonna want off when their kids aren't at school and they're Mm -hmm. uh, but so many other cultures are kid oriented you know uh, the U.S. Mm -hmm. we're only just now getting out of an era where up until this point and I've seen it I say up until this point because I don't have like um numbers or studies that prove this but I see people becoming and I think COVID had a lot to do with the shift of people being more uh, open and understanding to children being around because Mm -hmm. before that children were not only did they want to did they want the kids to be seen but not heard but in most cases they didn't want them to be seen either just children were to be tucked away where they were out of the way and not an issue whereas a lot of other cultures it's just normal to take your kids to work with you if you need to it's not mm-hmm. a big deal and of course that depends on like the industry that they're in and whatnot but I just find a lot of other cultures are so much more family centric and mm-hmm children oriented than ours and that above all else is one of the things that drives me absolutely insane about the American culture like there's a lot Mm -hmm. of problems with the American culture from my stance but that is one of the biggest things is that we sweep our children under the rug for the most part Mm -hmm. and um well that leads to problems because there's nothing more important in sustaining a society a culture a civilization than the upbringing the future right the future of the civilization is the children and if you don't give children what they need then they turn into um grown children they're not adults we they look like adults but they have never been Mm -hmm. taught how to regulate their emotions they've never been given the things that they need in order to thrive so they're uh damaged is a is a harsh word I don't really like that word but it's you know they're not putting out into the civilization civilization society in a productive and proper manner and Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases it's degrading the civilization and society so Mm -hmm. I feel like we could solve a lot of our problems as a world society um by taking from some of these other countries who are doing a better job in some areas than we are and that requires Mm -hmm. an open mind and a lot of people don't want to open their mind to other civilizations being better at some things than we are but those are things you can definitely find statistics on and studies Mm -hmm. on yeah especially I mean I think that the top one you mentioned I mean just being a mom I mean like getting like nine months off to like stay home with kids that's a completely normal thing in Europe like nobody would expect a woman to come back to the office even after like six months (laughs) you know what I mean or they can like split it and so like the dad so I'm like I had a friend who um was a freelancer and so his wife went back to work after like six months and he stayed home for like a whole nother year and took care of like the little girl and so it's just nice because it's more of like an even distribution of like the parenting first of all but also the kid gets to have you know to get to have a relationship with both of the parents and Mm -hmm. it's not seen as something that's like oh like martin wants to stay home with his daughter like (laughs) you know what i mean it's just like wow that's that's great that the man is sharing the responsibility and i i think um there are some areas in the u.s that like that could definitely be something that evolves i mean the time off and stuff like that so that the kids don't have to go to daycare right away when they're babies you know because plus it's just i mean it must be really hard as a mom to be like okay i don't want to go back to work and like leave my baby with some stranger because it's like that whole bonding period that you need yeah six weeks is the average six yeah. weeks like you're still healing at that point. yeah yeah yeah, yeah i know it's my european terrible. friends think that's insane they they think that's just like insane that that that's the the case there but it is insane. Yeah, to answer your question i don't know because like in culture wise it's hard to say which one i because like i uh I love living in Germany, but I think like I have to go with you on Spain. Like I really, I love Spain, especially I go in the winters because like it's warm, it's sunny, it's chill. People are like lively and happy. There's this, I don't know, just they're, they're positive and happy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. I mean, everybody would be in a better mood if we just all got a nap in the afternoon. Right. I think like, (laughs) you know, but but they have like longer work days, but they get the nap in there. So like, I don't know. I think maybe that's a good trade-off, you know? Yeah, I'd take it in a heartbeat. 
Exactly. Especially if, especially if we had like uh, everybody, because I, I struggle with uh, cooking a lot for a lot of reasons, a lot of things, and uh, it's not my forte. You know, I can clean. I'm a great sous chef. Like I can <laughs> prep some stuff. I can, but for some reason, like. I, I just, I'm not good at it. So that would take a ton of pressure off of me, a ton of stress off of me if it was just commonplace for everybody to help feed everybody, mm-hmm. which makes sense. You know, it shouldn't fall on one person anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, maybe Spain is in your future. Who knows? I, <laughs> who knows? I doubt it. Anytime my husband asked me uh, for years, years and years and years, uh, he stopped asking me actually but every time he did ask me where I wanted to go on vacation I'd be like uh Venice Egypt you know he'd be like yeah how about something a little bit more realistic <laughs> yeah exactly like, Look, I don't understand why it's not realistic okay like it because it's really not people think um people are really scared of traveling <clears throat> outside of their own country uh, mm. They think that it's more dangerous, that the crime rates are higher elsewhere, which is funny because it's not. And then uh, yeah, it's really, it's really not. I feel very, <laughs> I feel very safe in Europe, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, also they think that it's crazy expensive, which most places are not. Most places are a lot cheaper. I had um, a friend of mine whose mother moved to Italy uh, about. It was probably about five years ago at this point, but she bought an entire place for like twenty five hundred dollars or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it depends where. I mean, like, but I mean, Spain. There's a lot of retirees there for that reason. I mean, because like, there's a lot of places that it is cheaper to to buy it there, and the life is cheaper. I mean, even though it's still the euro, like Germany, like the money goes farther because everything's just a bit cheaper. Yeah, it's not dirt cheap or something like that. Like, don't misunderstand. But it's just it's cheaper than Germany, for example. It'd probably be like uh, the same comparison as living in New York or L.A. versus living in Athens, Alabama or Athens, Georgia. Right? Yeah. Except for pro- property, I feel like in the like in Georgia, at least. Well, maybe it's I think it's gone up now. But I mean, in comparison to like New York, like what you get in New York City for like five thousand dollars a month, you know, like a little shoebox with like. Yep. <laughs> you know they had you know on instagram they have all these feeds like this is what you get for five thousand dollars in brooklyn and it's just like oh my god and then it's like over here in i don't know denver or something like that this is what you get for this amount of month i mean it's just crazy uh difference yeah it's a culture shock everywhere you go everywhere every every place in the u.s is completely different you know i've Mm -hmm. been to la and i've never been out of the country unfortunately i plan to one day maybe Um, my husband wants to go on cruises and I'm like can we I don't like boats in the sea but (laughs) anyway anyway I almost got to go to Canada one time but my mom said I had to drive to Canada from Alabama yeah (laughs) I feel like there's quicker ways I don't know I mean who knows I love a good road trip don't get me wrong but I think like (laughs) there are quicker (laughs) quicker ways to get there yeah but I've been to LA and I've been to Louisiana and people don't, people in other countries don't realize how big the U.S. is. And yeah. we don't realize in the U.S. how small most other countries are. I have, uh, since I've been living online like this right here, since probably um, 10 years ago, at least, I've had friends all over the world and I've talked to them about all sorts of things and uh, especially when they're in other countries because I want to know about the culture and I want to know about Mm -hmm. their life and uh, I've had people tell me like it's insane that we can drive from one end of our country to the other end of our country in like three hours Mm -hmm. and I like to drive just from one end of Alabama to because I live in North Alabama five minutes from the Tennessee line so it takes me five minutes to get to Tennessee it takes me six and a half hours to get to the beach, which is the other end of the state, right? Mm-hmm. And so the culture difference in the U.S. is insane. And when you, and for so long, people were, you know, there, before we had the internet, your culture was developed by the people that you interacted with in person. And that's why you have, uh, similarities in people from the same locations. And, just chopping it up in the U.S. is extreme. So 
people want to get really um not so much anymore closed-minded but they for a long time they were very closed-minded about the uh, outsiders right and now that we have the internet and we're having this expansion of awareness that there are thousands of different ways to live Mm -hmm. in the world and if we can just kind of collaborate with all of that and keep talking to one another like we do here like what are y'all doing about this issue that's not an issue where you live well tell me more you know how did you solve that issue well I've totally you know my grandma said that wouldn't work but maybe it will maybe it will and so that's how we're creating a better future for us all right absolutely and I think like that's one of the ways that I've just learned so much about how different things work in different countries. I mean, especially like when you're there, but like, you know, you, cause I mean, a lot of my friends are from all different countries. So you'll be sitting around just discussing some topic and you're like, so how is it there? Wow. Is that what you guys do? Interesting. How does that work? Ah, oh, I never thought of it like that, you know, and there's so many ways to solve problems, but you have to be open to talking to people about their experiences and being like, okay, maybe we don't have it all figured out in this area. <laughs> that sounds pretty reasonable. I like where you're going with that. <laughs> so like, you know, and, but I mean, I think you have to start with the awareness that like, hmm, is this the best, is this the best we can really do? (laughs) Because in a lot of cases, you can always improve on things. There's no such thing in in most places of like, this is absolute perfection, no room for improvement anywhere, you know, because I mean, it's, it's always better. I mean, you can always improve anything, you know? Yeah. It, a lot of times it takes uh, us going against the grain of society and culture, mm-hmm. which is another thing I talk about a lot. It's really hard for a lot of us to uh, make the choices that are different for our own benefit simply because of how everybody else is going to feel about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I can tell you, like, I, went, I moved to Mexico when I was 20, and um, this was a long time ago. This was in 98. Okay. So, But like, nobody thought this was a good idea. (laughs) Let me just tell you that this was like before like all the internet stuff. And um, I didn't mention this before, but my grandmother was Mexican. So like, I I did like you, I took Spanish classes in high school. I could put like a string of words together, barely though. But, and I was like, no, I would like to actually go learn Spanish. And so like, I told my parents, like I saved up all this money. Like I was working at Applebee's and then like a sports bar, right? Oh my gosh, I worked at Applebee's for six years. Did you really? I, really yeah, I worked did. there. <laughs> I worked there for like uh, I think it was three years because I started as a hostess and then I was a waitress. Because um, and so I saved up all this money and like I was like I have to leave Minnesota. I don't know where I'm going. I just I know that I have to like get out of here and just see what else is is there in the world. And so I went to Mexico, but I told my parents this and they're like that's a terrible idea. <laughs> You're like why why would you want to do that? All my friends were like it's dangerous this is going to happen to you. This is going to get murdered. Why would you do that? Yeah. Like, blah, blah, blah. That. and Mexico was a lot safer in, in that time, seriously, um, as well, which always kind of surprised me. And then I went to London to do volunteer work. Nobody thought that was a good idea either. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and then when I told my dad I was moving to China, he was just like, <laughs> you know, I mean, my poor parents, at some point they've gotten used to it. You know, they're not really surprised, but they're just like, really, Andrea, like, China, like um, on the other end of the world, like Beijing, there's like 20, 25 million people there. Like, is that really what you need to do? And I was like, this is what is happening. Okay. So, um, but I think like what I've learned is if you, you know, if you don't do the things that you feel that you need to do, you might also not be happy with, with how things are. And I didn't want to end up being like resenting my family or something for telling me no, or like, I mean, even with business things, I mean, like whatever it is in your life that you want to do, you're always going to have people that don't think it's a good idea, Mm -hmm. but you have to listen to what you want, you know, um, or you won't do anything Mm -hmm. because you can't please anybody. (laughs) Yeah. Switching from that external validation to the internal validation is really what you have to hold on to. I've definitely uh, lived my life with a sense of, I don't want to be on my deathbed with regret, Mm -hmm. like wishing that I had, tried you know because you don't know until you try and you can tell yourself all day long it's like oh it won't work out it won't pan out uh stuff like that I don't get to do things like that well the truth of the matter is is that if there is a single person on this planet who is doing that thing that you want to do 
then it is possible for you to do it as well. And you will never know if you can make it happen, if you don't try to make it happen and it work, you got to work at it as hard as you feel called to work at it. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, like you can, you can do it for six months and then be like, I've had my feel, I'm done. And then you can backtrack if you want to, or you can just keep on going until the energy is spent and you don't want to anymore but you definitely should do it because it's like that I can't remember the woman's name but she's like a she was a nurse or something like that for like the end of life and the top five regrets of the dying and one of the top ones is I didn't have the courage to live authentically like to myself or something like that and I just always remember like wow that's why my my company is living deliberately today like there was did you see the dead poet society no with Robin Williams no no great movie you should see it anyway but it's based on um there's a poem and it's just talked about like i wanted to go to the woods to live it deliberately like yada 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 and then like so that at the end of my life i did not discover that i had not lived and i always like remember that and it struck me like it's very like hmm, like what's the difference between existing and really living yes i love that so much and i think that is a wonderful way to end this episode on that point right there So thank you so much for being with us today and having this conversation about all the things. Tell people where they can connect with you and what you have as services to or products or whatever you have to offer. Okay. I know. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the chance to be here. I have really loved our conversation. And um, for anybody who wants to connect with me, so www.dreahunt.com. That's D-R-E-A-H-U-N-T. And then I'm on social media, like um, on my Instagram, it's at living.deliberately.today because that's what I want everybody to do. <laughs> um, and this same thing on my uh, YouTube and then also my Facebook is Andrea Hunt. Um, living deliberately today personal empowerment coaching and i would love to hear from you guys awesome and i will definitely link all of that around so that nobody has to look too terribly hard for it yes please (laughs) thank you so much i hope you have a great day thank you so much you as well